I'll still wait a couple minutes, but um, before we start, but we are gonna dive in today on our part two of our uh, exercise four. So that'll be listed, you know, the link we already have. Um, same link as before, just um, as we scroll down to the bottom or towards the bottom, there's a part two. So we are going to be doing part two today. And let me just reorganize some windows here. So this is what we should be looking at. And um, there is this part two zip file. Uh, so that's the only thing you'll need for today. Download that. And um, I always give this warning uh, every, every class. I think there may still be um, a little bit of a um, hiccup with the tutorial. But everybody always ends up coming through fine. So, so again, if you're just joining us um, today, we are going to be doing part two of our processing tutorial. So you'll just want to navigate there, download that zip file and uh, hang tight for a second. And then we'll start up here in a couple minutes. that door gets shut. <laughs> okay, we're up to 15. Hey, I'm so popular. Like I'm a YouTube streamer. So cool. 15 people. Alrighty. I'm just going to clear out some junk that I had going from last class. We were, um, we just had a, a demo from a, the grad student of my animation class and she was going over like how to host um, our own kind of like uh, interactive animations um, and a website that you could literally just copy and share a URL. So that was kind of fun getting started with that. Um, we are animating with Adobe Animate, and then um, there's the option to build for like HTML5 Canvas. So um, none of the class is super into coding per se, but uh, it's not a, like a requirement of the class or anything, but um, so it's kind of fun to be able to just take what we've already learned. Um, and I don't need this. Cool Z's. Cool Z's. Um, I think I'm recording for a few people that might not be here today. And I think we have, um, across both classes, I have a few people that um, may have, may are, or may have already left the country. So they will be checking in remotely with um, videos. Um, uh, I guess 
if anybody, nobody reached out to me for questions on their project, which for either class, which is, um, sounds reassuring. They're like, oh, everybody knows what they want to do. However, I know that is not the case. Uh, this is the project where most people find that they don't know what's going on. Um, and just because there's a lot of different components to be going over, uh, what I find is after we do this step of the tutorial, uh, more people find a little bit more comfort in knowing like how they might start the project out or might structure the project um, so that they can kind of get their, you know, get an idea more together. So I definitely still want people to be coming to me if you have questions. Um, you know, we uh, do a screen share like this or just talk on the phone and, and walk through what's going on for, you know, your concerns. But after this, uh, a lot more should be clarified, I think, um, at least for you guys who have, you know, never done coding. This will be more, this is like more intro based. Um, it's a good way of structuring code in a logical manner. The way this project or this uh, part two exercise goes is um, kind of like a storybook, an interactive storybook, where you have the ability to kind of uh, move around wherever you want. So that ends up being a, a good entryway into coding for you newcomers. Um, so yeah, as we go along, remember to take notes. Um, you could take notes in your coding with the two slashes. So um, yeah, because this, this code um, exercise in particular will probably be the most reference that you guys will have for the, for, for the rest of your project. Um, and what I often find is a lot of people end up having to download it multiple times, especially the ones that are struggling who haven't done coding before. Um, you know, I'll come help them one day and like want to reference, you know, some code that they can copy and paste from here and they don't have it on the machine. So that we have to go and download it. Well, every time we're re-downloading it, we're losing potential notes as well. So what I recommend perhaps um, is if you guys already started a, a project folder, um, go ahead and end up saving this in your project folder. So this is a zip that I downloaded right from the website. And I'll give you guys like a readme in here, but uh, all this other data. So this processing exercise for part two folder, this whole thing, um, you should put this on your desktop. And then if you already have like a, a final project folder, I'd put it inside that. Right. So say you have your, you already started your final project or, you know, after today you all should be starting your final. And I say final project, but I mean, um, you know, um, project three is that reorganize the class. Um, so just make a project, final project folder, or I'll, I'll call this what probably makes more sense. Project 03 master folder. Right. And I, I, I'll reference master folder a few different times. And this is what I mean. It means that essentially, um, you know, all your, all your project 03, you know, your final project three folder should be in here, but then also, um, different re uh, reference files that you you guys are using. You could all have that in your master folder um, for your own sake of organization. Uh, when you go to upload it, ultimately, like we really don't need to have all those extra exercises and such. Um, so you ideally should be removing them before you submit your your final project or your you know the final um, submission. But for now, it's really nice to just be able to have. Uh, one master folder and everything in there so that like after today you're done 
Um, you can back this up to Google Drive, save it in a second spot, right? Uh, save it on the thumb drive as a second spot. Keep up that um, saving in multiple locations. And as you update this folder, you literally could just then drag and drop this, you know, into whatever drive and just replace the old version, right? You're only replacing one thing at a time. Super simple, right? Um, this way you never will lose your content. One folder, everything's in there. Um, so that being said, um, we're just gonna get started here. And as I mentioned, this exercise, um, it's kind of like navigation, page-based navigation. At the bottom, and I'm just mentioning this now, but um, you don't need this for right now. If you do run into problems, um, we can just take a moment and, I, and you could screen share um, and, and I can kind of walk you through what might be going on. However, um, there is this complete part two sketch that is at the bottom of this site. So you could also reference that. But I know that if you're new to coding, this, and especially if you haven't gotten in here to play around with code over this past week, like I, I was hoping you would, it's gonna be tricky to remember what's going on and how things are functioning and that sort of thing. So this might be hard to navigate, but it's here for you guys to be able to reference, right? Um, okay. So let me get this set up here. I don't like how, there. And again, um, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat, but if you guys have questions, it's best you just turn your mic on um, so that I can hear you. Close this. Close this. Okay. Why is this exercise one? I don't want exercise one. I want exercise two. Oh, there it is. Okay, so I don't know why this is called exercise one. Exercise 04, part one. That's what it should be. So sorry about that initial confusion if you guys have that on your computer. Anyhow, we are doing part two today and I'm just gonna go ahead and launch the file. And then what I would recommend is you guys follow this process maybe. Um, I personally find it easier working when I'm looking at a website. And hmm, actually, it might be tricky for you guys. Um, well, I'll, I'll just mention this again. Um, for those of you who have a trackpad, like on a Mac, or in a, a Mac in general, um, you can swipe between full desktops. So if you max, uh, full screen something, and you hit your F3 on your keyboard, you'll see that that full screen window goes into another desktop, right? So that could be a quick way, because um, if you do a four finger swipe left and right, you can switch between desktops. Um, so the one conundrum here is that you guys will have, you kind of need like a website open, the video chat open and processing open. So it might be a little, a little bit on one screen. Um, so I'll give you guys a second to try to just, um, arrange those two things or those three things. You know, kind of like keeping a keeping the window somewhere where you can see it. 
you know, if you do something like that, you might have a space for the window on the side. Um, I hope that makes sense. I would get that set up so that it's um, easier to, to walk through the rest of this today. Um, that way, when I'm talking, you can just glance over and see what I'm pointing at rather than, you know, you're on a different window or something. So um, my purpose is I don't need to look at myself. Um, I'm not that, uh, not that kind of guy. I'm just going to go ahead and throw the split screen up so it's, it's easier at a glance. Um, my dock, there we go, it goes away. And I think, you know, if you guys like have problems like um, seeing what I'm doing because you're on a smaller screen or something, any of that kind of information, let me know. Um, oops, that's not what I want. I'm going to turn up the font size. That didn't even turn it up. Oh, console, that's why, my mistake. Let's just do 14. Okay, that should be good. So finally getting started here. Um, a little bit later than I thought. That's a lot of ramble time, wow. Um, okay, so I think the first thing we want to do is um, just play this so you can see what's going on. And we should have just this background audio playing with a kind of a background video content. It's weird. Can't, um... So if you guys leave this play through the whole way to the end, you'll notice at the end that it's like the audio is really skippy. It's like it's like breaking or something. We're gonna be covering why that is. That's basically because of where we have um, that instance in our code. We probably just have it in a bad location. Um, so let's see if I can find this. So again, I guess probably what's the best to be doing here as a kind of a recap entry into what we did last week. Um, I'll just start at the top of the code, kind of walk down through, kind of recap on what everything is so that we have some orientation. So at the top, I just have a comment of like this entire thing of what's going on. Um, the one thing on here that I didn't put that, you know, in your guys' um, projects, by the time you submit them, you'll probably want to put something like, um, you know, telling the users like, please install the Minim library. Something simple like that. Um, therefore, when people go to play your project, they know why they're getting an error message and how to solve it, right? They just are missing a library. Really simple thing to not think about, but uh, it, it is helpful not only to other people, but like as you come back to your own projects, you know, in a year from now or something, and you're like, oh, I need to do, I want to do some kind of processing work. Well, you'll be revisiting this these types of sketches here. Um, so it's really a good idea to make sure you're keeping good notes for yourself as well. So here at the top, we're just getting these couple lines of code. Um, again, reminder, these are just needed by Minim, um, just for the library. And then we have this audio player, which is literally just telling processing, hey, we're gonna have an audio file, and the audio file is gonna have a name, right? That's all that that was covering. So these are all just naming one, two, three, four, five different audio files. However, 
we do have to also load them, which is going to be down here in setup. Um, so we'll talk about that in a second. And then we also are going to be um, checking out how to use images today. So that's what these are here. P image is literally just um, the syntax for telling processing, hey, we're going to be loading an image. And the image is going to have a name, and this is the name. So in essence, this line right here, line 34, is the same as like line 26. One's for audio, one's for images. Um, and again, you don't need to memorize P image or audio player. We have them in reference in this file, right? You just need to know that the, that is what they're doing. So going down into setup, we are loading the menu, which is a P image we see right here, right? So menu is loading from a particular file. And just for reference, in our data folder, we have that menu.jpg. So it's already in our data folder. Okay. So everything that we're loading in um, is already in our data folder. If you guys get like a null point exception when you're working on your own stuff, that usually is referring to the fact that you um, don't have the file in your folder or you didn't name it correctly or you didn't you know name it here correctly. Sometimes students put like JPEG right here, but the file is just .jpg. So it can be very particular. So you just have to be um, attuned to that. So in setup, we also are setting the canvas size. Um, we're also setting the background to menu instead of like saying a color, right? Like in the, in the past, we've just said like an RGB value, three, three numbers. Here, we're literally just loading, we're using menu, right? Well, what is menu? Menu is this image. So this syntax works for a color, but it also works for loading an image as long as we've uh, loaded the image. And then the same kind of stuff that we've covered last week was for this audio, right? You need this one line for minim, uh, but the rest are literally loading the files. So I think the conundrum that I was referring to a moment ago about the audio, like when, it, when, we, when we play this, the audio gets to the end and then just starts skipping. Because here we're actually playing the audio in draw. So the way you want to be thinking again of audio is a playhead. As the playhead is moving across the screen, um, it's at like a specific point in time on that timeline. So when draw goes to, to play that playhead from that spot, it's still at the previous location. So it's just going to play forward one you know, one frame or um, however you want to refresh that in your mind. So it's constantly moving forward. It's constantly playing from the play head. When you get to the end, it doesn't know to go back to the beginning um, unless you rewind the file. So if we did like um, elevator.rewind with you know, a, a decimal here or a dot in a rewind with the two parentheses. And we go to play this, we're not gonna hear anything. And the reason behind that is that rewind is putting the, the playhead of that audio file back to the beginning each time. So every frame, right, draws looping from top to bottom 60 times a second we're going to rewind the beginning, we're going to start playing the audio, and then we're going to rewind at the beginning again. So it's constantly just at the beginning, we don't, we're not going to hear anything. We might hear like a click. That's about it. So that's not the solution that we want. Um, last week, we did discover that if you put a number in here, you know, like, we want this to play, but play 15 times. Um, when we play this way, And now I'm not getting anything to play on my end. I broke it already. Let's
let's see if I can just do this. Okay, well, I think I've got something a little fishy that I haven't fully figured out. I've never thought that putting the number in there works as just demonstrated here. Um, but the previous example we did last week from Dominic Licata, his example did work. Um, and I don't recall why. Player one dot loop. Hmm. That's not what I was wanting to look at. Anyway, continuing forward the best we can. There is still a solution to this. It's just, um, I thought we might have multiple solutions, but maybe not, so. Okay, so um, does anybody have any initial questions right now? On, um, because I guess the, the this is pretty short right now. This is like declaring some stuff, setting something up, and in draw, we're like literally just playing audio and drawing the background. So if you don't grasp this, um, the rest of class is gonna be a nightmare and um, you're not gonna be able to start your projects. So oftentimes what I have is like students who get, you know, days after this, or, you know, maybe next Monday, they'll let me know like, oh, I, was, I didn't really know what I was doing in, in the, the example we did in class or didn't, they didn't understand it. So I guess the biggest thing is um, owning up to that, you know, confusion now. I, I wouldn't really know what's going on now if I didn't do coding before either. So um, make sure you're just staying on top of that if uh, nobody has questions right now. Moving forward then, I suppose, that I'm talking to this wall in front of me. Um, we're gonna copy this on step three. We're just declaring a couple new integer values. I'm gonna put those up here at the top with our other integers, right? I just copy and pasted that. And that's not gonna change anything in our code yet. We're just declaring some things to then be able to use these. Um, one of them is called resize and one of them is called grow, right? Um, and I did re-mention re this and I guess I'll reiterate on this just so that we're all in the same mindset. Integers, again, they're just containers to hold a value, right? We went over the example of like, what is a perfect score? Well, we, we imagine 100, but we would have to say 100, right? So here we're saying there's an integer the integer is called resize, and we didn't set a value. So what is the value? The value will still be equal to zero, even though we didn't set it. However, this one we did set to zero. Um, does that differ than the zero from resize? No, they're both zero. So, um, so these integers, we're just declaring a name. That name we then can set values to later on. Um, and that's what we're going to get into now. So step four, we're gonna go ahead and delete the original background being drawn and audio being played, and we're gonna relocate it. So we'll go ahead and delete those two things, right? Delete that there, so there's nothing in draw right now. And then we're gonna copy step five and paste that into draw. And copy and paste. And so why don't we uh, go ahead and play this. And we should see that we have these squares moving around, but only when we move the mouse and they're kind of rotating from the middle of the page and they're changing color, right? Depending on where my mouse is located, they're changing colors. So this is like a very simple um, example visually, right? It's not that complicated visually. 
Uh, but it is pretty, it does start to get a little complicated, uh, kind of pretty quick, code wise. Um, I'm just going to lower my desk here so I can sit down. My desk moves very slowly. Um, okay, going back here. So let's take a look and see what this is. I like to review each each chunk of code as we paste it, so we we're all kind of following following on here. Um, keep going down here. I'm almost done. Okay. So it, and once we're all in here, it, if we do a command T again, that's gonna do that um, cleanup. So everything's kind of organized well on the left-hand side. And so kind of going back to that reference point of what content is nested inside of uh, you know, itself, like what's the parent, what's the child kind of uh, components of the code. Well, we know that we have draw starting here, right? And if you click right there next to that bracket, it'll highlight the ending bracket, right? And this is really per, this seems like, oh yeah, okay, I get it. But the biggest problem that most of you will start to encounter here as we go along is that you're gonna be pasting things in the wrong spot. Uh, and you're gonna end up losing track of these brackets. These brackets are what enable to have a container. As soon as you remove one, the container doesn't know how to function. So as you'll notice, if I click next to that bracket, the ending one highlights itself. And I, I already put a note there that's saying that this is ending draw. Well, does that bracket actually end draw? Well, yes, because it's highlighting, right? If they are highlighting each other like correctly, we know that uh, it should be working and that's basically because I put a note in there, right? So as you go along and do your own, putting these notes in to kind of help you remember what's doing what is gonna help you stay organized. So, okay, that's starting draw. However, we now have this if conditional, right? It's the first thing we have. If scene is zero, well, is scene zero right now? We just, we just put this at the top. Our integer scene is zero. Yes, it is zero. Therefore, when we start this program, scene is zero, yes. Therefore, everything after this bracket will be executed, right? If everything is, if scene is zero, if that is true, it's equal to true, um, or if it returns true, then everything will be executed. So you can click, the, just like we did with draw, if you click that bracket, it'll show you the ending bracket. And we see right there, end scene zero, right? I, and that's just a note to tell me that that bracket is what that is uh, referring to. So if I highlight all this, this is literally everything in between those brackets. So everything there that's highlighted, that's inside of scene zero and that whole component of if, the whole if conditional itself is located within draw. So you, we should really make sure we're comprehending that we have this container that's draw, right? This void. And inside of that, we have this if conditional. And inside that if conditional, we have other, other content, right? We're organizing. So, the reason we do this is later, if we decide, oh, you know what? I wanna to go to a different scene, right? Kind of like a different storybook page. All I would have to do is change the value of, of scene to be not something other than zero. And if scene is, is say one, right? Which we're gonna get into. If scene is one, this no longer is true. So then we wouldn't be doing all this stuff. We're gonna be getting into that example. I'm just kind of outlining it for you now. 
So since we're in scene zero, uh, we do we are drawing the background of menu, and we're kind of like pausing any other audio, which isn't really relevant right now, but later it'll make sense. Um, kind of like if we have background audio from a different scene and we came back to scene zero, we would want to pause all that audio. So that's kind of what that's doing. Um, translate is something that we haven't looked at yet in an example. I have mentioned it. Um, it moves the origin point. Okay. So the origin point is literally like where your grid is starting from, right? So if we play this and we look, by default, the origin point is the top left of the screen, right? And we're going over on the x-axis and down, um, like increasing a number value, going down on the y-axis. Well, translate allows you to take that point and move that point anywhere you want. So I move that point to the center of the page and we're rotating these, this stuff around the new origin point. So I'm gonna review that with you just so it makes a little sense here. Um, the canvas, as we see up here, is 1000 wide by 600 tall. So literally smack dab in the middle of that, if we half it, that's those values here. So translating right to the middle. Okay. Then, um, and if you wanted to learn more about Translate, you could always, again, right, you can click on that, right click on it, and find in reference, and that'll bring you right to the page that shows you information about Translate with examples and other related stuff like um, rotate. Push pop matrix is also something relevant. Um, it's not gonna, I'm not gonna go into that unless uh, somebody needs it though. Okay, um, let's see if I can, option, there we go. So the rotate function, this is um, also something you would just have to reference because uh, it does get into math, but um, we're rotating it based on adding our mouse X and mouse Y value. And so because we're moving our mouse, or when, when we do move our mouse, those values are constantly changing. Therefore, this number is gonna change. And then when we do that math, uh, we will see a change on the screen. Um, same thing with the color based on our mouse locations. Um, and right now the rectangles are being drawn by adding something plus 20 well what's grow what's what's grow uh, right now we have grow as an instance at the top or as an integer but um, it's set to zero and nowhere else in our code are we like having grow add to itself right like last week we were having these values add to themselves so far we're not doing any of that so right now, because grow is zero, it's literally saying like zero plus 20 is 20. So it's never changing the scale of these um, shapes. Uh, so that's what we're gonna get into next is kind of uh, tweaking those. Uh, getting them to activate themselves. So we're moving on to step six. And again, just get a holler if you have questions. So we're going to copy this chunk of code from six. And we're going to paste it uh, just after draw and just before the if conditional. So by, I guess that's not the most specific I could say. Um, what I mean there is um, after we start to draw, not literally after draw ends. Um, so literally right after we have void draw, but right before um, if scene is zero. So I'm just gonna return down, paste. And then I always like to have a little bit of 
extra returned lines just so that my content is kind of separate, right? We can kind of, you kind of visually see like chunks of information separately. Okay, and Command T will make it organized if it's not. And let's play this. So we should see, as soon as you start moving around, these shapes should still rotate, but now they're scaling from the center, right? They're, shift, they're scaling up and then scaling back down. And this alone is well worthy of doing a whole project. So if you guys are still not fully in a boat or you know exactly what you're doing, um, it doesn't have to be page-based like this is gonna be getting into. Uh, it doesn't have to be like a full-on hardcore game. You could be exploring just based on um, you know pushing shapes around and interacting with those shapes in interesting ways. Um, and there's tons of examples online dealing with like transparency and overlays and um, um, I guess the really interesting stuff starts to get into like object oriented stuff, but it doesn't have to. It's just playing around with shapes and numbers. Um, I just thought I mentioned like this in its own right could be a whole project. So let's go back and take a look at that and make sure it's comprehensible here. So as I mentioned before, grow was not moving. It was just the value of zero. So that's why um, these shapes that we were drawing down here, these rectangles, they're not moving because it was just the size of 20. It was just small rectangles. Well now, grow is moving. It is growing or shrinking Therefore, that value then gets injected in here, right? Um, so I'm going to cover that more. Um, and this is something that I didn't put in the, in the guide, but maybe it's a good point um, to talk about now so that... Um, it's, it's more pertinent while I introduce it. Right after this line, after 70, or well, you have a different line, I guess, but um, right after that, that info that we just pasted in, if we return down a line um, and we type in print ln parentheses, we're gonna say um, uh, quotation, we're going to say grow space equals space and then end that with another quotation. And we're going to say uh, plus grow. I believe this is what we want. Let's, I'm gonna take a look at that. Yes, okay. So um, I'm gonna go back so you guys can see that bit of code again, but just for reference, I am playing this in the background. Those, those shapes are moving. So this is a line of code I just had you type. And this could be anywhere in draw. Um, what this is allowing you to do is troubleshoot, diagnose problems. And the way that works is that it's print, print um, is a function that allows us to literally have numbers appear here in the console. See, so we have this like console that's been sitting down here, this black void. And we haven't been really utilizing that yet. Um, print allows us to print stuff in there. Uh, and if we didn't have print ln, if we just had print, 
uh, we could use that, but then I'll show you the problem that occurs is that it doesn't return by a line and it's really hard to read. So print ln um, sets your value down there in the console and then it returns a line down each time. So it's a little bit more logical to read, right? So what, what we're doing here is we're in the console, anything in quotation marks will show up as text, even spaces. So that's why I have grow space equals space. You'll see that that relates down here in the, in the, in the console, right? And then we're going to also be adding, and by adding, we just mean like also putting into this print line, uh, the value of grow. And as you can see, once you run this, it's constantly changing. And this is because grow is, is updating. And this is um, right here. So as we talk about this, it's nice to, to be able to see it exec being executed, I think. So we have two different sets of if conditionals here, right? You can kind of tell by how they're oriented on the left-hand side. So we have one that's here and a second one here. And the first one, we'll start with the first one. It's just saying if resize is zero. Well, the first time this is launched, this program is launched, resize is zero at the top. We didn't specify anything, it's just zero. So because that is true, um, I put a note here saying, this tells grow to add to itself if resize is, you know, if that is, if this um, condition is true. So if a condition is true, what happens? Well, everything inside the parentheses is gonna execute, right? Same thing we've been talking about as we go along. So what's happening? Grow is equaling itself plus one. So it's adding to itself. And then still with inside of these brackets, we have another nested if conditional, right? So we can keep nesting more and more content within itself um, as long as it's logical for the program. So what I'm getting at here is that um, uh, I, I realized we made one, I made one mistake, but we're going to cover what that mistake is. Um, I'll just keep continuing on. So if grow is 100, then we're going to change the value of resize. So resize, when we, when we launched this program, resize was one, or was zero. And then if, if we go through this grow process, which you see these numbers down here, adding and then subtracting, if we reach 100, all of a sudden, we're gonna say, oh, well, resize is now gonna be equal to one. Okay, so just keep in your mind, okay, resize is now one. Well, if resize is one, this condition is no longer met. Therefore, we are not gonna be executing anything inside of this conditional. And one thing we were executing was grow is adding to itself. However, because resize is now equal to one, this conditional is true. This It's met. This condition is met, right? And so now we're going to be executing everything inside of this condition. And the only thing that's changing is that grow is now subtracting itself by one. And then if we reach a, a low side value, um, we're going to set the value of resize back to zero, which means then we're gonna go back to having this to be true. So what I want you to really see is this is like a teeter-totter, you know, or like a, um, a timer, like a sand timer, 
where you have one on and it's going to run down and then once it's done you flip it back over that's what's happening here and the way that it's made was entirely based on code that I made up. I made that integer called resize and I made an integer called grow. And I'm having one component change a value to then execute another component. Does that make sense? Like, Processing didn't make this example. This isn't like something that's out on the web other than on my website. And this is like super basic, but I want what I want you to really click here is that like you don't need this because I made it. You can make your own components like this. It's just following through a logic. Um, does anybody not comprehend how this is working? I feel like I may have... Um, went over it well, but I want to just double check. Like everybody should know right now how this highlighted section is outputting these numbers in the console. Yeah, I feel like I'm getting, getting the concept, but then like I have a little question about um, like uh, the, the, the space between void, draw, and an if. And like, so like the loop, it looks like looping, but, but these two different ifs. Um, like, um, what to say? So what is, um, so by, by putting the one more, like when you see the number 63 and then 65, there's a one space big, or 64, right? And then like when you see number 78, like you also see the space or print in and then another if or number 80. So is that means like, um, this, this app, like a, this, um, space means like, making a loop for only the number between 65 and 60, uh, 76 then? Um, this if you mean? Yeah, yeah, that's right. This if ends right there. Oh, okay, uh-huh. So you could, you, if, it, if it helps you to like see it with a space, you can add a space. Um, oh, okay. and, and again, kind of going back to um, the simplest way to comprehend these brackets is um, there's two ways really. One is that if you keep if you keep your um, code organized with that command T option mm -hmm. to auto format, things will be aligned on the left hand side. Mm -hmm. So you can see like if this bracket is in the same location as where that if starts, uh -huh. that, that means that it's it's ending that, right? Oh, I see, I see. I see. Otherwise you can also always click right next to a bracket. Mm -hmm. And it'll show you the other end of that bracket. I see. Definitely. Right. So that's that's a that's a good question. Yeah, because these spaces I have here don't mean anything. I could just return this down oh. forever, that's and it. the program's just gonna think this is nothing. It's just gonna go right to the next line after as it would normally. Yeah. Yep. So just the space in here is um, just for your own visual organization. Mm. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Also, um, for the values coming out at the bottom, like what part of the code is creating those values? Like, is there an equation somewhere? Like, I just don't get what those numbers are coming from. Um, this that's what I went over here. This isn't on the website. I just had you guys type this in. Did you Did you get this in here? Yeah, I get that. Like, that's showing the values, but I'm just kind of confused by the meaning of the actual numbers. Like, I get that that showed us those values, but like ah. Why are those numbers those numbers? Yep. Okay. Yep. I'll, I'll walk through that um, that kind of reasoning here again. So um, starting off, I guess, when the program starts, right, um, what is the value of grow? Zero. Okay. So if we're starting with a basis that grow is zero, then when we start looping everything in draw, um, resize is zero, right? That's also here. So since that is true, we're going to start executing the stuff that's in there and grow starts to, to like grow in value. It starts, the numbers starts to change because 
we're doing math right here. So we're almost like nesting this math inside of a condition. Um, so either the math happens or the math doesn't happen based on if that condition is true or if it's false. And so when we start the program, the very first time like draws coming down through, right? It's doing line 63 and then 64, 65. Once it gets to 66 here, the value grows zero. So zero plus one is, is one, right? So the new value of grow is going to be assigned the value of grow plus one. So then grow all of a sudden equals one. And then the second time you run through this, resize is still set to zero. So the value of grow is two. So you're gonna set the, va the new value of grow to be two plus one, or sorry, it's one. Right, we just had it, added it to be one. I got ahead of myself. Um, it's just constantly updating itself plus one. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, I get it now. So this is just like an exponential like function, where it's just adding on top of itself continuously. Yep. And and the the good way to think about this isn't saying grow equals grow plus one. It's really because um, we're just having one equal sign. It's, you want to think of that logic as saying like this, this um, integer grow is assigning itself a value and this is the new value. And you could do whatever ever kind of math you want there. You could be using any kind of integers to do that math. You know, you could just keep going and whatever plus. And um, it won't matter, you know, divided by a grow. And like all this kind of stuff will be working. But in reality, um, just to have the cedar saw or uh, seesaw, <laughs> cedar saw, uh, seesaw going, it's just flowing constantly at a smooth pace up and then flowing back down. And it's flowing down because once, do you, do you grasp that logic of the, of why it's going back down then? Yeah, so does this mean once it, once it hits 100, then it goes back to one? Is that what that means? So once grow is equaling 100, then this condition here is now true, right? Grow is 100, yes. Okay, then what? What is it, what's gonna happen? Well, everything inside of those two brackets then is what's gonna happen. And, or sorry, uh, between that one bracket. And all we're saying is resize is now gonna be assigned a new value of one. So because resize is one, this is no longer true. So we are not going to be adding a value of one to grow. But since resize is one, this is now true. And now we're gonna be assigning grow to itself minus one. So we're gonna be subtracting one. Oh, okay, it makes sense now. Yeah, and it's like, it's like a weird conundrum to walk yourself through. And then once you get it, you're like, oh, duh, okay, now that makes sense. And utilizing these like really basic tools like completely transforms what you're able to do in the program. And it's it's not really, it's not creating anything really complicated. Um, like this is, if you looked at or object oriented stuff, you wouldn't know what's going on. Um, even after like a whole, class exercise, it wouldn't make sense yet. So uh, does anybody else have questions on how this is working? Yeah, I have a additional question on line number 66. So this line number 66 means like, um, it, like it's gonna continuously grow. Like, so, so when you see like nine thirty something, when grow is equal to one, I think, and like grow is equal to zero, like, and then like, so the, the second row in here is gonna be zero, and then so because it's like gonna be zero point zero plus one, so that it becomes row equal to one. Then correct. And that it continuously grow until the nine number sixty-seven, seven um, hundred. Is that is that the like is that the mean? Is that what? Like like for like like. So nine number sixty six like grow plus one right? Is this means 
it's gonna continuously edit but the one the number one gonna be continuously edited in line numbers correct so like for instance if we were to comment out mm -hmm. line 68 where we're we're changing the value of resize mm -hmm. if we never change the value of resize it's always going to be zero. Therefore, grow is always going to keep adding. And if we play that, it just will never shrink. It'll just keep going past where we can't see it anymore. Mm -hmm. And if we look in the code, that number is also reflecting that. Oh, I see. So literally, this, this line is um, the gatekeeper, right? Because this is the gate. We're only growing if resize is zero. So since oh. once we reach a certain size, mm -hmm. um, we're then saying, okay, gatekeeper, we don't need you. We're going to go to this other village or whatever, however you want to think about it, you know? Okay, gotcha. Cool. Yep, thank you. Any, is, that, is that help for everybody? It's still okay to be confused if you're still confused. Uh, it's better for me to make sure you all you all are um, coherent with this right now rather than you know meeting in uh, office hours like five more times to cover the same thing. And obviously, like if it makes sense now, you might forget it as we go. But um, again, that's why I always often recommend like. You know, put in a couple of comments here and and write a comment out that in a way that makes sense to you, so you'll remember it. You know. Okay, cool. Let's uh, let's maybe Command S, save it as we go along. So um, step seven, we're going to start to activate these background arrows and to go into a different scene. So this is a bit more code than the previous ones because we're also adding another scene. So it's a little tricky to make sure you just get the orange parts. And we're just gonna copy that. And uh, let's see where we're pasting this. We're gonna paste this um, after void draw ends. So literally this time, void draw is ending here with this bracket. So we're just gonna return a few lines down, right? Like there's nothing beyond this. This is just empty space. And we're gonna paste it down here. Okay. So a decent chunk of stuff. Uh, mine looks like it's already auto formatted. Yeah. Um, you may or may not have to do that. But it is helpful to have the, the nice formatting so you can see what's going on. Um, and even here, things look like they're all in one big chunk. Um, but if it helps you, you could always like, um, you know, put, put lines in between each, between each conditional. So like if this one starts here and ends there, you can put a line there. Um, scene one starts here and ends there. So you, so you can kind of break stuff up um, with returns if you wanted to see, you know, chunks of data a little bit more clearly. So really, what we have here is um, three different scenes or like navigations of scenes um, in this new void. So void mouse pressed right here. Um, we don't have the find and reference for that. Um, for, for, for sake of clarity, I'm just going to show you guys. Why can't I type here? Hello, Chrome. Oh, okay. Chrome is trying to be difficult. It's weird. So, on the processing website, like just processing.org, um, on the left hand side, they have reference, right? 
this reference page shows like everything that you really need, like all the basic components. And um, all these are links to the example, like the reference file. So just like most stuff here in processing, if you right click, uh, you know, like loop, what is loop? What is loop doing? You could find in reference what loop is. Um, however, this mouse pressed, this void mouse pressed, there's no find in reference for that. So um, if you wanted to find the reference for it, you go to the processing website, you go to references, and then you do like a command F, like search in the page. And you just do mouse pressed. And if you just search mouse, it'll show you everything relating to mouse. And um, there's two different types of mouse pressed. One of them has like brackets, uh, parentheses, and one doesn't. So there's different ways you can utilize mouse pressed. Um, one of the ways is like just inside of draw, you can have kind of like a checking to see if a mouse is pressed like in that scene. However, the way I like to situate it for you guys is to just completely break it apart from draw. Uh, and then you guys can reference back and forth. Give me one second. It looks like my computer power cable is not plugged in. Okay. Otherwise my video feed was going to be um, Where was I? So, so the way this is oriented now our car is that we're declaring um, we're declaring these global variables up. We're then sending our document with void setup. We have void draw, which is looping anything that we want to be drawing on the canvas, right? Continuously looping. And then we have this void test. This you can is navigation elements between the two scenes. Literally, all we are using void mouse press for, and this is imp important that you comprehend, um, it's only when you press down the mouse. When you, when you click down, things in here are here checking themselves. So you could void mouse press kind of like an if condition, right? We're only going to be doing stuff inside there if the mouse is clicked. So because that is like kind of a different mentality than like things looping and draw, I have I've, I like to have this reference of it separated. So I can think of like, oh, where am I clicking? And then kind of a, um, down here. There's different ways of doing it. Um, but essentially down here, let, let, let play this and we'll see what's going on. And then we can talk about it. So we should have this, um, and I thought we were adding, maybe that's coming up soon. Um, so everything's moving correctly. I click the left arrow here. I can hear new audio for like this ET, but I don't see anything new other than my shape stop moving. Right, and if I go back and I click the right arrow, right arrow, same difference. I start to I start to hear music from the that movie, and stop moving. We didn't change any. any. Why Why is that? I want to. so. Look at the code and we'll differentiate why that has happened. Mine won't let me play it, so if there's an unexpected token void and then it highlights the void mouse press function and it says it's an unexpected token. Um, do you have the include like bracket at the end as well? Yeah, there's the bracket at the end after. And is there anything after that? Oh, no, the last bracket I have is MC2, so maybe that's 
Oh, yep. So you're you're probably just missing um, the end there. Oh, see, I added that bracket, and then it still says that's not my second token. Um, okay. We uh we might be a little pressed for time because I kind of took 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 a lot of these explanations out a little bit. Um, it's easier when I'm in person to know if people are in troubles, but for some reason on here, um, it takes a little bit more co coercing to ask for troubles. Yeah. So why don't you go ahead? Could you, could you share your screen with me at the bottom? You should be able to like click the little share button and then at the top it'll say, um, screen. Mm -hmm. I think this is it. Yep. So if you want to just like full screen that for the time being. Um, okay. And, ah, okay. So go down a little bit. Right there. Yeah. So see, you have, um, you actually have lines like 135 through 141. That's all. Um, that's all just instructions from the website. That's not actual code. I so get rid of this. Yep. And then um, see that line one thirty four. How there's an underline right there. Mm -hmm. That if you click right there and scroll up. Yep, and I'll just scroll. Oops. Oh. Yeah, just click there once. Okay, it's ending in the right spot. Oh, this void mouse pressed should be coming after. So yeah, select um, select the entire thing. Yep, from right before it. Um, um, oh, interesting. So that very first thing in line 95, mm -hmm. you could delete that. And then scroll down to the bottom. I'm not sure. Oh, I think you might have went ahead. Lines 137. Is that, um, did you just go ahead a little bit, I think? I mean, I think I went copy and pasted some of the we were on. I don't think I went farther than that. Maybe I did. Yeah, I think Maybe you. I, this? I think you did. Yeah, all the way down to the bottom. You could delete all that. Delete all of it. I think. Yep. And then go ahead and play. Okay, yeah, that works. Yep. Yeah. So I think you just when you went to select, you went down past some um, comments, and you and there was more orange down there. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's uh, just a simple mistake. Okay. Cool. I can. Um, I can take back over here. Okay. Um, and yeah, that's why I always like to um, put these comments at the end of like major brackets because then you can, it, it's helpful to remember like where things are ending. Um, and then also like, you know, putting ample amounts of returns in or something like that. So, okay. So, What's going on here now is we're setting up these conditions and, and as, you, as we've covered conditions several times now, it should start to make more sense of like, it's just checking to see if something is true or false, right? So if the scene is zero, we're gonna be doing stuff. Well, what are we doing? Well, we're actually just setting other conditions inside of that, okay? So, okay, is the mouse pressed? Yes, it's being pressed. Is the scene zero? Yes, it is in scene zero. Okay, and then is the mouse in these coordinates? And this is what we went over with um, kind of like uh, operators. We're adding multiple if conditions um, one after another using these two ampersands. So it's kind of like saying, 
um, if mouse x is greater than 14, and then on the next line putting another if condition. But instead of having four if conditions, we're just having this one. And so what this is doing is basically it's isolating that where mouse is over the button. So this is the first button on the, on the left hand side, right? Mouse is only over a teeny bit um, and it's down 95 and it's, or sorry, it's down 266 on the Y, but less than 348 on the Y. Um, so that's really just isolating the fact that we're only clicking within a, a square location of where that button is at. So um, if we do click there, we're rewinding the audio for ET and then we're looping the audio for ET. And the value of scene is setting itself to one, okay? So that's all we're doing if we're clicking there. So why isn't the background updating? Why are we still seeing scene zero? Well, we're not drawing here in mouse pressed and void mouse pressed. As we specified, this is just the navigation, right? The scene is now set to, to one, but in draw, we actually have to to specify what will be being drawn in scene one, right? So, say again. So it means that we gotta like we gotta put another code for scene equal to one then. Yeah, so that's what I was gonna go up here and look at is, um, in void draw, we do have this if scene zero thing is set up. Um, Uh, but that's it. And I'm wondering, to be honest, it should probably be with inside scene, scene zero, but I don't, I don't think it's going to mess anything up right now. Um, we'll see, we'll see what happens. So yeah, we have a, if scene is zero, right? But we don't have anything that's saying, well, what happens if scene is one? Is it going to do anything if scene is one? We don't have that set up. So... Um, that's what step eight is, is we want to select everything in step eight. And as we go down, make sure you go slow so you're not going too far. Okay, copy that. And then this is going to be pasted in, in the draw condition, uh, in the void draw, underneath of scene zero, before, before we end void draw. Right, we want it to be encapsulated inside of draw. So we're gonna return down a few lines and put it kind of right there. And um, we could always space that out with an extra return if we want. So we can see, um, we can see that we, if we have an if scene is zero now, followed by an if scene is one, and followed by an if scene is two, right? So kind of going back to that logic, in mouse pressed, if we were on scene zero and we click the mouse and our mouse is on that left side, which was the arrow to go to the ET page, um, we're gonna go to scene one or we're gonna set the value of scene to one. It's a better way to be thinking about it. We're setting the value of scene to one. And then if scene is now equal to one, we're gonna be executing everything here that's inside uh, of draw, right? We're in draw. And everything that's gonna be executed here is pertaining to what we want to be seen or played on scene one. So if you play that, now when we that button, left hand side we should we should get to that scene and we should he should video accordingly right and I added, I added a feature here which is if you click the finger and the you'll get an audio effect and something a little funky is going on with my audio but that's fine um 
So in scene one, this is in draw. I do have the other alternative version that I mentioned in mouse presses. Um, you could set it up as a condition or um, yeah, a conditional kind of statement. If mouse is pressed, um, and if your mouse is in a specific coordinate, which this is ET's finger, right? This is the coordinates for his finger. Um, what are you going to do? We're going to play the ouch noise. So you can still have stuff um, for being, for presses inside of draw if you wanted to. I just like the sense of following this navigation separately um, so that when I, when I have a problem with like how I'm getting from one area of my code to another area of my code, I know that I can come down here and troubleshoot because it's kind of separated mindset. Um, continuing with that, the logic of what we've pasted inside of void mouse pressed. Um, once we get to scene one, right? This ET scene one. We hit say next at the bottom, right? We're going to the next scene. Um, but actually I didn't hear the audio, but the button is working. So where, where how is that button working? Um, well, we already, we already set it up in mouse pressed, right? So we have to think through that logic. Okay. What scene were we on? Was it scene zero that we were on? No, it was the scene, which is here. Scene one ET. I guess I could have uh, added this kind of stuff. Elevator, ET. Uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, okay. So um, if we're on scene one and we click in a certain spot, uh, which is that right, the right button, that's the location for that spot, uh, we're gonna go to scene two. So if we scene two, what is happening in scene two? Well, right now, when we go to scene two, um, we're not pausing anything. That's commented out for some reason. Um, and there's, we should see the lights. Oh, we did see the lights. Um, any audio start playing so I guess the one thing we could do is um, inside draw inside this condition if scene is two we could get rid of these comments so that we do actually pause you know like if we were just on ET and then we go into scene two um, we should get get the ET audio to pause so let's see if that works Yes. And I am getting crackling and stuff. I'm not sure if you guys hear like crackling of the audio, but I believe that's just because of the, the formatting of the audio that I did. I think it was probably like eight bit audio, which is, I think the conundrum there, but. Um, and the same kind of problem will be happening um, if we go from the nightmare to, uh, if we hit next on the um, Nightmare Before Christmas scene, we're not gonna get the audio to pause unless we uncomment this. Um, and this is in scene one, right? Like these commented uh, things that were in scene one. Everything you write after two uh, uh, slashes is like a, it's like a kind of memo, and, and then the processing doesn't like uh, recognize as like some kind of command. Correct. Okay. Yep. And that could be anything. Like that could be for your own troubleshooting. Like you, you want to say right now, like, oh, you know what? Um, 
what's a good example here? Like, okay, right now I don't want to have this rectangle grow or rectangle show up at all. So you could comment that whole line out. And then when you play the, you're only going to have one rectangle. Gotcha. Yep. So you can use it to kind of like um, check what's happening without deleting something. That, that could be helpful. Because um, then you have a bunch of stuff commented out. Also, instead of just, um, you know, one line of code like this, um, Yeah, you could like you could highlight a, a chunk of code, like one. Like you could do command slash, which will will do it for you, or um, you could highlight an entire section, like you know, like oh, you know what? I don't want scene one to be used at all. Rather than going in there and putting slashes on every single line, um, you could be able to highlight it all and then do a command uh, slash, and that'll do it for you. And then when you want to undo that, you just select it all again, and then um, command slash again. Gotcha. Uh, there also is like the way of, um, like at the top, instead of slashes, you could do this this method. Um, this is like a multi-line comment, right? So you have all the slashes in between uh, in the beginning of every line, um, you just set the starting point for the comment and the ending point. Mm -hmm. Yep. So where are we in here? We are step eight. Um, I think that's the end. I, I got here and I'm like, wait, what am I missing? Um, I think that's it, but there is a, we were kind of going slow at the beginning and then all of a sudden I kind of just threw out a bunch of stuff like, like in terms of, oh, we're copying and pasting these whole sections. Um, and I think that for some people that is a decent and they get confused. So, um, we definitely have more time. I want to make sure we're all getting through this. Does anybody have any error messages? Smooth so far, huh? Um, note here. Um, my processing phase like the package PDF does not exist. Do you know what that's uh, about me? Can you say it again? Um, my processing says like the package PDF does not exist. And you be missing a library. Have you you've already been playing this uh, sketch today, right? Um, no, I, I just because I couldn't really run the processing so that I was just following a video. Um, oh, you haven't been running processing yet? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So you probably just have it installed Minim. Have you, you have, have you gone? Have you... How so? Um, um, I couldn't hear you because it was like, kind of buggy. Okay. Have you installed the Minim library? Um, the website, right? In processing. Oh. Um, so you'll have to go to tool. When you're in processing, you have to go to tools and add tool. Mm -hmm. And then you'll click on the left libraries. Uh -huh. And then um, you'll have to search their Minim. And you should have a green check mark. Oh, okay. And if you don't have that checked, you'll have to install it. And um, then your program should work fine. I see. And yeah. if it doesn't if it doesn't work fine, you'll want to just save and quit 
um, mm -hmm. processing and then reopen it. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, it sounded to me like a, a library thing that DFF is something I've seen before. Oh, yeah, it's, it's working properly now. Great. Things, things working. Mm -hmm. And so on this website here, I put in, um, this is something you all should be familiar with, like in Photoshop, Illustrator, whatever. Um, you have the option of using um, rulers in the program. So like Photoshop, if you turn on rulers or hit Command R, these rulers will show, show up. And you can right click on the ruler and specify if you wanna see like pixels or inches, right? Um, well, you also can click on those rulers and then drag down guides. That's what these are kind of outlining. Um, and then you could use things like um, the measure tool to measure the distances. You could use the info panel in Photoshop to like see where your mouse is on the, the image. All of that stuff is doable, but it's kind of old school. Um, I like to use a new method that pretty much blows this old method out of the water. And I'll go over that real quick so it makes sense for you guys. Um, so in draw, I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna put this resize thing inside of scene zero. Um, okay, so at the top of draw, we just had this like print line of growing, right? That's all we're showing up down here. However, we could actually print the mouse coordinates. And allowing that will be really good when you start to diagnose like, well, how do I know if the mouse needs to be greater than 14? Maybe it has to be greater than 18, right? Like what are these, how do I find these numbers? And that's what I can show you how to do right now. So regardless if you guys are stuck on something and you're not saying anything, uh, or if you're all caught up, Go ahead and follow me with this, this step here. Um, so at the draw, where we have this print line, go ahead and copy that line. And we're gonna paste it a couple times. And we'll just change this from being grow to mouse X and this to mouse X with a capital X, right? It needs to highlight with a uh, with red and then mouse Y. Right. Um, and then once we play this, actually, I'm going to have to exit full screen screen better. If you, if your console like underneath of what you're looking at right you get to see your numbers update in real in while you're while you're moving it on the canvas right uh this is like like change your status for how smooth it is to be able to point and get your enter them uh I went like two semesters not with students not having this option. It was uh, pretty low. So this will make it way smoother to map things out. So realistically, now since we have that set up, if we go down to look here, look here first click that we said we mouse pressed, right? Like void mouse pressed, if scene is zero, which this is right now, right? Um, Like left, e. how do we know it's left here? Left, we're gonna we're gonna map it out right now. Saying if mouse X is greater than greater than well, if we're hovering on the very left hand side, is mouse X greater than greater than down there in the console? Yes, it is current fourteen. Therefore, that is true. Is it greater than fourteen? Yes. Second condition with two ampersand is that mouse X 
also has to have a, a value of less than 95. Well, less than the right is this less than 95? It's 94. And then same premise with the mouse, mouse, mouse right? So kind of mapping all those conditions. Greater than an X, less than an X. Um, this doesn't quite apply is these scenes like this, where the button is like in a bottom corner. Well, obviously going to be greater than zero X. I don't need to list that. Um, so scene two, or sorry, on the ET scene, you'll notice there's only two core. Because literally we just need to have like a greater and, and, a, and a less than. Um, I'm really kind of worried because I am not hearing a lot of questions. <laughs> um, like how, how can we know that, um, like uh, the, the menu bar was like under 15 of the X side of the mouse? How the, the, like bu the you button, you mean? Just, hmm? The button? Yeah, like when you just show us the ET and then the menu at the left side of the bottom, like, um, then like when you see not, uh, line number 151, it says the mouse X is uh, smaller than 150, right? So how do we know the 150? Like right here, you mean? Yeah. So, one second. So, um, point around, like if we point the mouse to the very left, that's going to be like zero, zero, zero. The mouse X and mouse Y. As you start to go down, that's great. that's great. Y coordinate. So we set these conditions. If um, if, if in zero in scene one, which is the E, and if our mouse X is less than one fifth, so the mouse X is the left, right? Correct. As long as we are. 150 it'll click kind of a little bit far over you know sometimes it's nice to users a little bit of flexibility and like you know, how how precise they are um and the one the one thing to note here guys is you're not going to want to use just a a plain plan that doesn't change um, when you have buttons like this it's better have buttons to be see, like transparent PNGs because then you can update transparent PNGs. Um, uh, you know, if your mouse is not then look at the image with a different color uh, rather than it just being like, oh, no, I can click on this menu, right? Because I a website or something, you hover over it, you get you. That um that pre oh hey please click me I'm I'm active so that's one layer of interactivity that you'll want to want out for your projects and that's also like ideally is um a footnote you'll probably like add to your um storyboards if you don't have it on, on there um, these little little uh, mapping a mapping head or on paper help you map it out in your head a little bit better too once you like oh yeah i want to have these hovers well then when you build the seal um you'll start building content for or so and then, i guess, I guess um, since we have a few does anybody else anybody
views when I'm in full screen. Uh, uh, turtle. Ah, oh, what was that? Baby turtle eating a freaking strawberry? Get out of town. God damn you, State Farm. Go All right, we really need this turtle eating a freaking strawberry, guys. Or is it just the very beginning? Yeah. There he is. There he is. Oop. All right, anyway, I'm just going to take a screenshot. Okay. You'll want a higher resolution if you're going to be doing stuff. What I'm getting at here is um, I'm kind of giving you insight as to a good to if you do decide to like heavily based, based that sort of thing. Um, um, you can take an image like this in Photoshop. Kind of like a good workflow to be using. Um, because what often happens, you guys will make content and then realize like, oh, you know what? I need to think about this content. And then you have to like start over almost. So just like we were like, Photoshop for your own projects. While you're designing content for or this interactive project, also be saving your project files like in Photoshop in their own right. So then you master that export proper what you need. So well, if I have this image here, the first thing I want to probably do is like, okay, I want to use this as a background right now. It's a pretty small background, right? Like a thousand pixels wide, something like that. Um, and some is for screen, so that's what we want. So kind of initially setting the width. So then, um, if you're going to use this as like a background, um, a project, project content, you want to make sure that width and height are both set accurately. Um, because when you do use an image as a background, it can be the exact same um, size as your can canvas. If your canvas in a background is different uh, resolution, you'll get an error message. So once you, once it's kind of set to a default, what I like to then do um, is then use this as a to say like. If I want rulers, ruler, command R, I could say, I could say you know what? I'm going to have all of all things in the bottom right and the bottom bottom. And then literally, uh, you can take text, put in whatever in here. Uh, walk. So is the turtle away, or is the turtle going to eat? Sorry. Why can I? Oh, there it goes. Okay, and again, this is just black text right now. Now, but the 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 important thing to note is that this text is freely editable and I have the option to have to have exactly where I want it to be once we get into processing. Now, if you want to use that and uh, have two different states, states like it is now, but then when I hover over it, it's over right. What you could do is hide all the others, right? You could duplicate this and when you say one of them's default and one of them is hover. And so the default one's black, black is 
I'm gonna hide behind. You go in here, on here, it. You turn it to be white. Boom. So now I have one that's white and one that's white. And literally now, exports of both options. Save as PNG. And we'll name this uh, walk. Okay. Hover. Right, and you literally just literally your project folder, wherever your project folder, your master, master file. So and you'd save the same one for, um, for your background, right? You you save all these different components so that then when you're in your project, you could still use this background in um, in processing as, as it's going to load up in the background. And on top of the background, you're able to then draw other images. And you literally, literally draw this, this uh, a background on, on because it's a transparent image. It kind of just as it is right there, hover. And then if condition that's kind of setting yourself, if your mouse is in this location, you know, draw. Uh, Mouse, uh, this one is cover. If your mouse is in a different location, you're going to have the data, which is black or whatever. Kind of like try to make sure you understand your structure, which kind of page or, you know, whatever type of project you're doing, and start to step back and um, break down the process of how to organize that information. And it works for you so that have to continually do more do more on because once i have this project pro project saved back in here tweak you know like oh i don't oh I don't i'm gonna change the font well that's fine then you just you save that image as a transparent piece you're done rather than like what if this whole entire thing as an image when you text down there and then you have to like resave that and then re and then, or like what if you didn't save the photo file you have to like start um so this saves a ton of time um since we already done done photoshop just to your advantage in building your content a lot of images um yeah i my ramble there anybody have anybody before we end class